<clears throat> my presentation for today is called uh, Connecting the Brains, Telepathy, Cybernetics, and Anomalous Cognition. Uh, and actually, uh, I guess that my presentation will significantly differ from other presentations during this workshop because it's more historically inclined and analyzes some specific uh, episodes in the history of non-communist uh, science in Soviet Union. In, in particular, uh, the studies of telepathy and extrasensory perception among the Soviet cyberneticians in the 60s. So actually, before uh, I start, I probably have to outline my own background uh, and why I found this, uh, this episode of history interesting to my own uh, studies. So my, uh, my initial background was in phenomenology and in activism. That's why I based my approach on the ideas of active, uh, inactive inference and empathy, as well as social cognition and the idea of mental institutions, meaning that I'm interested in uh, the questions of mutual understanding of persons and their comprehension of uh, each other's inner states in the reflexive movement of mirroring each other's uh, internal processes and <clears throat> Basically, phenomenology proposes one of the most useful frameworks for analyzing it theoretically and empirically. But uh, since I was uh, more, uh, um, since I was dwelling into the history of uh, the reception of phenomenology in the Soviet Union and in uh, contemporary Russian academia, uh, I was interested in some specific and parascientific uh, receptions of phenomenology and close uh, and some close approaches in, inside the context of the cybernetic movement in the Soviet Union. And probably I have to say that in USSR, cybernetics was something like a common language for many uh, scientists working in different traditions. And eventually uh, beginning as the prohibited uh, pseudo-scientific language and framework of anti-communist propaganda, Eventually, it became a common language for uh, for scientists, bureaucrats, and decision makers in the late stages of Soviet Union when they uh, tried to create fully automated Soviet economy. So, uh, th and this is the co the context for all, all of this study. And well, maybe I will begin with outlining my implications as the theoretician and historian. So what regards mental institutions? Actually, I borrow this concept from an active account of social cognition and perception developed by Sean Gallagher, and especially uh, from this quotation from his paper uh, uh, with Krizafi from 2009, I quote, other people relying on processes that are larger than their own individual brains, write the books and build the museums specifically for the purpose of communicating and storing information, controlling behavior, and generating more knowledge. If we think that cognition supervenes on the vehicle of the notebook, it seems reasonable to say that it supervenes on the vehicle of the museum, an institution designed for just such purposes. Indeed, given the nature of such mental institutions, including the learning practices that are propagated in educational institutions, it may be more appropriate to say that the cognition that goes on in one's individual head is really derivative from or perhaps an internalized version of these larger processes, socially instituted processes that are ongoing and, uh, and outside of any particular individual's head. So here in this quotation, we see the development of the idea of extended cognition, uh, implying that cognition can be redistributed on technologies or other people or uh, other external neurocognitive processes uh, as storing information or providing it in some useful way. Uh, but here we can see that these mental institutions can be performed by uh, social uh, institutes, social practices, which uh, sp spreads knowledge and information about the world without uh, the necessity to borrow it inside one's memory. So, Actually, uh, for, to, to my view, to my historical view, it implies some relevance to the 19th century psychological uh, understanding of uh, communication and, uh, and the psyche, because as Liza Blackman says, it implies the contagious approach to communication, uh, stressing the individual's influence on each other in so-called sympathetic transmission complete sympathetic union or permeability to the influence of others. 
And actually, we can see <clears throat> back in the 19th century at the rise of empirical psychology with introspection and other practices and methods uh, developing, we uh, could see the, implica the ontological implication of the porous body per permeable by the environment, both in psychology and in medicine, uh, which is uh, kind of um, considered to be obsolete by modern bi biomedical science, for example, but still in some approaches in medicine and holistic psychology, we can see the, uh, the renewal and reconsideration of this idea uh, today. And uh, actually telepathy was one of the prerequisites for uh, the phenomenon of telepathy as an anomalous cognition was one of the prerequisites for reconsidering this idea. So it implied some strange concepts like mental touch, spiritual telegraph, and uh, utilizing different technological artifacts, which uh, provided the metaphors for explaining this phenomenon and for conceptualizing it as, as a phenomenon worth of scientific study, empirical study, uh, uh, implying it, at, it as the problem of communication and mutual understanding of persons. So it implies the idea of immaterial contact transcending bodies and language using the nonverbal medium. Uh, and actually we can see the reception of this idea in history of technology. For example, photography, when it emerged, uh, it was used in scientific uh, evidence, and but also it was used as the evidence of the presence of the ghosts. Uh, and uh, photography uh, provoked a very big uh, parascientific uh, influence uh, among the educated circles in Europe uh, and provided some metaphors for mystical experiences and encounters with some supernatural phenomena. And the same holds for radio technologies, for telegraph and other technologies which are were developing in late 19th, early 20th century. And one of the interesting instances of this idea was uh, a novel by uh, a so er early Soviet uh, science fiction author called Alexander Belyaev. Uh, uh, it was his novel called Master of the Worlds. And uh, you see the quote, uh, small quote from this uh, work. Uh, Moscow has become a city of great silence. We hardly talk to each other since we learn to directly exchange thoughts. How cumbersome and slow the old way of talking seems to us now. It is possible that over time we'll completely forget how to speak. Soon we will archive the mail, the telegraph, and even the radio. So here we can see this Bolshevik optimism regarding applying new technologies to uh, societal developments and uh, utilization of some new com communicational techniques for improving mutual understanding and social cooperation inside these mental institutions of uh, the new Soviet state. But um, actually, it implies uh, the idea which I called utopia of communication, which I borrow from uh, a poet, uh, Evgenia Suslova, who studied telepathy historically as one of the instances of utopia of communication that is a complete transparency of other to your uh, understanding to your empathy that you can comprehend the other's inner state without any limits and without any uh, obstacles uh, such as verbal communication or other uh, ways of articulating your uh, thoughts and feelings in using symbols for example but uh, it implied some scientific metaphors uh, and some scientific approaches which are somehow relevant here. For example, the idea of bodies as conductors with currents flowing through them, uh, implying electricity as a so-called life force. And actually these ideas were widespread in the uh, 1920s in, Soviet, in early Soviet Russia, when uh, scholars such as Bekhtiev uh, and early neuropsychologists from Soviet Union uh, studied uh, these parascientific phenomena using uh, available techniques and empirical uh, methods. And uh, actually, uh, it has relevance to the idea of shared instead of isolated singular experiences, implying something like a mode of being with or intercorporeality and plurality of experiences. Uh, and basically, the results of Bekhtiev and other people. Uh, from the 20s, 30s was that uh, the primary media for uh, telepathic communication was kinesthetics, non-cognitive repetition and compulsion, and 
some uh, trans individual perceptions uh, of affective and emotional states uh, using uh, different uh, technologies for establishing this some some kind of relational ontology of the person, the person as existing in between uh, the communicating uh, instances. So <clears throat> going to uh, the specific example and case I would like to talk about today is a specific uh, episode in history of Soviet science in the early years of reception of uh, allowance and reception of cybernetics uh, by the Soviet government. So in the late 50s, when the boom of cybernetics was just beginning, uh, and it was still a big discussion among philosophers and scientists in the USSR how to situate cybernetics as the universal science of uh, control, communication, and feedback mechanisms, how to situate it and embed inside communist ideology. So there were a lot of discussions on how, for example, to introduce the category of information inside the dialectical materialist worldview and many other discussions which were more or less fruitful and influential to the scientific developments and technological developments in the computer science, for example, and in creating uh, some uh, new management approaches to the Soviet economy or healthcare or other branches of uh, national economy. So uh, in the late 50s, there, there was a small circle of researchers who were basically neuro, uh, neurophysiologists by uh, their primary education and scientific activity uh, or engineers uh, or uh, other uh, representatives of psychology and uh, more natural, natural scientific inclined psychology, such as, for example, Bernard Kaczynski, Solomon Gellerstein, who was one of the founding figures of labor psychology in the USSR, Dmitry Mirza, uh, researcher of electromagnetic radiation of the brain, and Alexander Pressman, an outstanding uh, biophysicist who was interested on the effect of solar flays on, uh, on human health and on human physiology. And actually, their cybernetics, uh, cybernetic background helped them to situate telepathy as one of the extreme instances of communication, because for them, it was nothing more, nothing less than a specific kind of fluctuation of electromagnetic fields in, emitted by the brain. Uh, that's why they uh, admired the metaphors of radio station, radio communication, and the exchange of uh, wave, uh, waves and particles between these two instances, uh, these two points of information exchange. So for them, cybernetics was a mostly useful uh, frame, of net, uh, frame of reference to analyze this phenomenon. So in 1960, the state uh, allocated some funds for the study of telepathy, based, of course, on military purposes, uh, especially uh, in the fields of studies of communication in conditions of impossibility of radio connection, for example, uh, deep in the sea or in the ocean. And they were based on some rumors about the American studies of parapsychology, which were also uh, financed widely by Harvard University and American militaries. And uh, actually, they created the Laboratory of Electromagnetic Fields and Aerions at the Physiological Institute of the Faculty of Biology of Leningrad State University. And the head of this, uh, uh, and uh, Leonid Vasiliev, a, a great uh, um, neurophysiologist, brain scientist from the Soviet Union, became the head of this laboratory and they initiated the experiments, which actually reproduced the experiments which Vasiliev, being a disciple of Bekhterev, uh, performed in the 30s uh, with animals and humans, uh, and actually they reenacted the same experiments with no actually uh, with no uh, outstanding discoveries, but still it was important for them to, and it provoked a big uh, reception in Soviet culture in the 60s. And the thing is that uh, it it was based ideologically. It was based on on Lenin's idea that. The thought that has mastered the masses becomes a material force. So they borrowed this uh, this analogy literally and embraced it as uh, one of the uh, ideological pillars of their scientific research in this field. Uh, and they implied that the brain is able to transmit thoughts 
where a radio wave will not pass. And actually, it's based on this ideological trope of the new Soviet man, uh, kind of a superpowered creature who is able to create communism and build a new society with uh, great powers and with a great will and cognitive capabilities. And actually, it's led to several developments. And uh, now I will tell more about them. So the first one was Pavel Guliaev, a neurophysiologist who uh, tried to develop the electromagnetic explanation of telepathy. So uh, the carrier or the medium of telepathy, that is the piece of information to be delivered via, uh, via this uh, extrasensory communication, is a physical field produced by the brain. And actually, the question was, what is the nature of this physical field? Should it be something uh, already known by physics or something new, something like uh, an ether or something, uh, some other alternative media for uh, propagating this informational uh, of these messages? So for him, it was the problem how to uh, explain it electromagnetically, or if electromagnetic explanation is, isn't valid, then we have to invent something something different, something new. And uh, for him, it was neutrino uh, as particles, which can hypothetically borrow the pieces of information. By contrast, uh, Vasiliev suggested introducing a completely new physical field uh, with an analogy between telepathy and gravity. And both of them act over long distances and bend across obstacles. So they are basically able to diffract and have the properties of neutrinos. So somehow uh, disagreeing with Guliaev uh, in the field of measuring the effects of telepathy, he still maintained the idea that we have to find something like a new, a new fields of uh, interaction, new physical fields to explain this phenomenon. So, and finally, uh, Ippolit Kogan, uh, a cybernetician and mathematician and engineer, uh, literally said that telepathy is an applied information theory. And this is the idea which intrigues me the, uh, mostly, because how can we understand tele telepathy as an application of uh, mathematical studies of communication in terms of Claude Shannon and my Michael Weaver to uh, use these experimental settings. And you see on, uh, on this slide, uh, the photos from one of the classified documents uh, from the 60s. It was a book by Vasiliev uh, with his report on uh, this study, which were un unsuccessful, of course. Uh, you see this uh, Faraday chamber and some uh, devices to measure the electromagnetic activity of the brain and the attempts to um, hide the signal and to uh, somehow transmit it uh, where different technologies. And uh, actually uh, in the 70s, uh, and especially in the contribution of Alexander Pressman, uh, it's developed into the idea of the biomagnetic fields as repository and transmitter of information, which follows the basic uh, laws of cybernetics and connects all living beings. So it's, uh, it's capable of feedback loops of purposefulness and control. And actually, it was the maximum development of uh, cybernetic metaphor, metaphorics for explaining the far-reaching uh, in interconnections between different entities in uh, the ecosystem. So in telepathic contact, not only the inductor and the percipient are connected, where inductor is the person who sends, who transmits or emits these uh, telepathic signals, and the percipient is the person who uh, receives these messages, so not only the inductor and percipients are connected, but also plants, animals, and microorganisms between them transmitting the disturbance of the, of the biomagnetic fields of Earth. So somehow they uh, developed it into a holistic conception, which connects everything with every, everything else. So it's kind of a, one of the uh, possibilities to create theory of everything for, this, uh, for these scholars. Uh, and eventually, Guliaev created a, a device called electro-aurograph, which could capture, which speculatively could capture electrical signals of different natural processes in organism, uh, organisms and inorganic life. And for example, he measured the uh, electromagnetic activity of bumblebees, butterflies, ants, grasshoppers, and human organs, especially the human hearts 
to indicate and to fixate this uh, extrasensory telepathic activity of uh, different kinds of bodies. And here you can see the illustration from the manuscripts by Guliaev, in which he uh, introduces several uh, types of communication that is uh, verbal informational communication with uh, the sound fields as its medium, and then hypothetical te telepathic connection with the hypothetical medium called psychon. So, uh, and the third one is oral electromagnetic connection uh, communication with the electromagnetic field as, as, as its basic medium. So here we can see the attempt to integrate different views and to integrate several levels of analysis of these uh, processes of communication. Uh, and actually, there are several dimensions of this communication for these scholars from the 60s, a thought transmission and thought reading, so mental suggestion and telemnesia, uh, briefly speaking. And actually, uh, especially regarding thought transmission and suggestion, the extra transmission of the inductor's intense thought to the recipient, uh, who plays the role of passive receiver of the telepathy and transmitted to them. Actually, it was gender-based because in many cases, the inductor was man, uh, a scientist uh, himself, while the uh, recipient was, uh, was a woman, uh, especially with mental illness, because they borrowed the patients from uh, mental clinics. Uh, to in, uh, to perform their experimentations. So uh, it was based on several metaphors and several strong beliefs uh, in Soviet society regarding the social connections and social hierarchy as well. So here you can see the attempts to model telepath uh, telepathic communication with different uh, branches of uh, uh, sending thoughts, receiving thoughts, and sending and receiving pieces of information which uh, eventually led to the idea of intercerebral electromagnetic induction, especially in the contribution of uh, Kaczynski, who was an engineer and who was deeply interested in radio technologies in the 20s. Uh, and he developed the idea of the uh, electromagnetic radiation as a neuropsychic process accompanied by the flow of an electric current inductor in the brain which produces electromagnetic waves of a certain length in the environment, so-called brain radio waves, reaching the brain of the recipient, uh, of the percipient, exciting similar neuropsychic processes in it. So it was based on, uh, on the combination between uh, development of radio, radio engineering and knowledge of bioelectricity in the brain, which was actually began by Bechterev himself, Bechterev himself and Kaczynski was also a student of Bechterev, and he uh, tried to continue it in more sci-fi sci uh, style, so to speak. And here you can see the illustration of uh, uh, from the book by Kaczynski called Bio Biological uh, uh, Radio Communication, uh, in which he tries to conceptualize the human brain and human uh, nervous system as one of the instances of radio circuits. Uh, emitting signals and receiving signals. So here you can see this metaphor uh, as in its full uh, full blown form. Uh, here you can see the slide from later Pressman's uh, monography about the biosphere and its cyber, uh, cybernetic connections. So you see here you can see the attempt to unify different uh, organisms and uh, to connect ontogeny with phylogeny in the fields of informational processing and uh, these electromagnetic disturbances and so on and so forth. So uh, actually they were thinking about the brain radio, which is no different from radio telegraphy uh, and the curvature of the Earth's surface and the terrain do not prevent the spread of telepathic signals. Uh, that's why they thought that it is something, probably something more than simply electromagnetic communication or biomagnetic communication. It's something more because it can reach big distances, not only several hundred meters, but even seven kilometers from the laboratory of the Brain Institute in Leningrad uh, with mental suggestion of sleep and wakefulness, uh, which was carried out successfully uh, as if the inductor was in the same uh, room as the percipient. So 
Regarding the definition in terms of cybernetics, why it is relevant, why it is interesting to the historians of science, because telepathy is defined as a special form of information or communication of living beings expressed in the direct influence of the neuropsychic process of one being on the neuropsychic process of another being without the help of the senses known to us. So basically, it utilizes the concept, concepts of information and communication uh, using the brain as uh, the receiver and transmitter of these signals. So they literally utilize a lot of cybernetic concepts. And it is interesting to analyze how they uh, reinterpret these concepts, how they embed them in the parascientific research and how they try to expand the cybernetic worldview to encompass such phenomena as telepathy or extrasensory perception, for example. Uh, because actually uh, in this analyze, uh, analyzes uh, these two beings, a telepathic couple uh, are a cybernetic pair, a pair of two communicating systems with feedback loops uh, between them. Uh, having the same or at least similar neuropsychic processes. And what is interesting here, and this what is still uh, intrigues me as a historian, at least, is the idea of how to introduce theory, mathematical theory of communication in this field. Because uh, as Kogan said, uh, telepathy is applied theory of information. Uh, and certainly uh, he refers to Shannon's uh, communication theory with uh, the definitions of communication system consisting of source, transmitter, channel, receiver, and destination uh, with a set of messages is finite, finite and equally probable. So uh, the problem is how to implement this idea, uh, how to implement this mathematical theory in the field of telepathy studies for these scholars, because it was still open uh, an open question for them how to implement it and how to utilize it in a scientifically coherent way especially regarding the uh, performance of these experiments uh, using different techniques and technologies to uh, detect these uh, emissions and these re receiving and sending the information. So here you can see the definition of communication system. So the source which creates messages, transmitter which processes uh, is into signals, channel as the medium and receiver which restores this information to Send, sending them to destination. And uh, here you can see the scheme of this. Uh, so the, the problem is how to, uh, how to uh, intervene uh, telepathy in this structure, how to intervene in inside this uh, schema. Because here you can see the noise source uh, as the thing which uh, introduces some disturbances in the transmission of the signal and probably uh, it might be relevant to think about the position of noise, especially in this holistic planetary thinking uh, about the uh, communication between different living beings. So probably uh, we can uh, move forward to the ideas of uh, Cecil Malaspina, a, con a contemporary scholar from continental tradition who analyzes the relations between signal and noise in uh, information processing. Uh, claiming that noise is not simply neg the negation of, inform uh, of information or signal, but rather a potential signal. So signal is, uh, is, uh, is an organized negation of noise reflecting the level of organization of the system. So in this sense, the question is how to use it uh, in telepathy, how to uh, apply it, especially... You have five more minutes. Okay, thank you. So the question is how to implement these ideas, uh, especially regarding the discussion between Shannon, uh, Wiener, and von Förster about the definition of information regarding entropy, uh, certainty or uncertainty, and noise. So for me, uh, noise as the possible information or unqualified uncertainty as the precondition of information is the source of uh, reflection and thinking about telepathy and uh, its applications in uh, this historical cybernetic field. And actually, what I want to see, uh, how I want to conclude this is uh, with the idea of uh, mental state of noise emphasized by Malaspina, because she says that 
the natural condition of communicating systems in humans is the this inter internally experienced state of crowding and confusion created by a variety of different stimuli, quantity, in, intensity, and inter un unpredictability, which make it difficult to tolerate and organize experience in urban noise and internal chaos of psychic uh, disturbances. And the question is historically, once again, and conceptually as well, is how to uh, how uh, telepathy is possible uh, when even the cybernetic systems in Claude Shannon and in Norbert Wiener always experience this internal noise. Uh, how can we uh, send the telepathic signal without being distracted by the noise and disturbances of the feelings of being overwhelmed by uh, by uh, the environment, especially regarding the fact that uh, these Soviet scholars used the mental uh, the patients with mental illnesses to study uh, these uh, this capability for receiving and transmitting signals without any verbal media. Uh, so actually, this it leads to the disintegration and loss of self, which uh, leads to the loss of boundary. And we go back again to this 19th century ideas of the permeability of the body and uh, of the actually of this idea of porousness of subject. And actually, as Lisa Blackman said, uh, and I'll go back to her to her book about uh, immaterial bodies. As uh, Blackman said, uh, it was telepathy which opened the possibility for studying empathy in psychology in the uh, during the rise of scientific psychology in, in the nineteenth century. So probably uh, telepathy can be one of the instances of uh, study of empathy within cybernetics uh, because it, it it's interesting not only as a contribution to the parascientific or unconventional research in the Soviet Union or worldwide or in the context of the international cybernetic movement, but also in the context of how can we uh, apply cybernetic framework to the non-scientific phenomena? How can we uh, apply it to study things which are uh, evidently in existence? Uh, and how, and besides that, how cybernetics allowed the scholars to study it, how uh, their, their personal interest in these phenomena led them to uh, use cybernetics as a suitable framework to organize experiments and even to get funding from the state. So it's a, a question uh, of uh, social determinants and maybe some cultural beliefs which, are, uh, which were influential during these periods of the 50s, 60s. And uh, last but not least, uh, what is interesting here is the dependence on technologies and metaphors because it implies something like an alternative cognitivism in these studies of telepathy, I mean, because uh, while, uh, while the mainstream cybernetics and cognitive early cognitive science considered human brain as a computer, and it's one of the basic metaphors of cognitivism, brain as computational machine manipulating for formal symbols according to the preconscious rules. Uh, for these scholars, uh, brain was rather a radio station, not a computer. So this change of metaphors is also of big interest here because it can be, uh, the problem is how to bridge cybernetics with this interest in the digital and digital machines in particular with the idea of uh, analog signal transmission in radio stations. And finally, the question uh, which is still open for me is the idea of applied information theory. So how can we uh, interpret this idea, uh, properly speaking, uh, using this very case as one of the interest, interesting instances of this parascientific underground research in the Soviet uh, science? Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention.